My Gavan and Melanine, and well met indeed. I'm Arakir Galadirathan, and welcome back to the channel as we discuss our thoughts on the Rings of Power. I am again today joined by Hi Ganel. Hello. Jessica. Uh, and we're going to talk about our overall opinions of the Rings of Power, and it shall be done thusly. Jessica will start by telling you what she liked, then I'll tell you what I liked, then she'll tell you what she disliked, and I as well. And then we'll end with a general overview of what we thought of the whole show. Um, so, without any further ado whatsoever, Jessica, would you like to tell the good people at home what you liked about The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power? Yes. So, I like the fact that I like the world building of the show. Like, I thought that was really good. We got to see different of how different aspects of what Middle Earth is like. Obviously, we got to see the wider elements of Middle Earth and the fact that there's Numenor. They made reference to Beleriand, which I don't think that's had gone by that point but obviously I don't think that's really ever mentioned in Lord of the Rings um so that was interesting I liked like all the sweeping shots I liked the references to the bits that we'd seen or I'd seen in Lord of the Rings and that's where I've obviously seen it um so I liked all of that I thought it was really good like I felt like it felt real like it it didn't f there were only a few scenes that I felt I thought felt like a set mm -hmm. um I thought it, it felt like lived in and like it was a functioning world and, yeah. I, and I really liked that and I don't think you get that feel on a lot of shows I think a lot of them you can other when the when they're in like a road or in a shop or on a street rather it's obvious that they're on a set um and I think that I think it's evident that they they pumped loads of money into that set I thought the costumes were amazing um I thought the music was really good um, I just thought there was so much thought put into that and, that and I just thought it looked visually really good mm -hmm. um, and I really really liked that um, aspect of it um, yeah. contrary to um, what Gannon and I have discussed at the beginning I really liked the startup I thought it was really relaxing I liked the theme tune I liked the visual I thought it was oh, good the sand, the sand yeah the sand rings and the trees and I thought it was good I like I like stuff like that what a, what a damning review there <laughs> the best bit about your show was the introduction where no, no one talks and nothing happens I haven't said that <laughs> I'm saying things that I liked about it and I liked that I thought it was I thought it was good um, the thought process behind that um, I thought was really good um i really enjoyed the story of mount doom i thought that was that was good um you know every day was a school day um with that one i thought that was good um those that episode i thought was the the, the one that kept me on my seat the most to see like it was exciting the fact that we had like the um, what you call it the backup coming in reinforcements coming in always a good bit of any show when that happens um and it was nice to see like fighting that what that didn't look clearly staged as there were other elements in the show um so that was that i enjoyed that whole storyline i enjoyed the whole story of the men um and the, the of, of that area and how mordor was formed <laughs> i thought that was really good um and seeing it as a not you know like a barren wasteland as we see it in hmm. lord of the rings obviously we've discussed that they're in even in the 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 fellowship and the war of the ring time or era there are elements of mordor which are really lush and people are farming we, but we don't see that um, no, in, don't. in the show so it was good to see like how that would be, what that would be and, and there would be people who you know there are people that wanted to be on sauron's side and um, wanted to do that rather than the fact that they were all enslaved um so that was interesting um i liked that as well um i liked the dwarves storyline i thought that was that was one of my favorite things about the show um i thought durin and disa were amazing they were excellent um in the show elrond i really liked as well um i thought his story was really interesting and i thought him as a as an actor was really good i thought uh halbrand was also really good um and i he I mean, I thought he, I thought he was good as Halbrand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the actor for Halbrand. The actor was Halbrand. Yeah, I thought yeah. was really good. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed that. I thought Gil Galad was really good as well, or Gil, Gil Galad or Gil Galad, um, depending on. But anyway, um, he I thought was also very good. I but there was uh, generally speaking, I thought most of the acting was was good, um, in the show, and I thought, and I will come on to the bits that I didn't think. Uh, later but there were lots of elements of the show that I thought were really well done um, 
in 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 general mm-hmm. um my last bit which i know that you were going to disagree with me before is mm-hmm. i liked elements of the hobbits i thought some of it was interesting i thought it was nice to have bits of it that hinted at how they were in the lord of the rings films and how they're suspicious of everything and where that comes from and the fact that they're a little bit frustrating to men in that element where they're taking stuff with the people uh, where the men were saying that how they're the halflings or the, the people that were running the people going through the field with the helmets on with the deer helmet Mm. and they were referencing the fact that they're oh there are these small things that run around and take stuff i thought that was quite interesting and i liked learning a bit about the hobbits i liked um i liked lenny henry's character i thought he was really good i really enjoyed him um and i i i, I didn't yeah i liked elements of the hobbits i don't necessarily think they fit um, but I liked elements of the Hobbits and learning a bit more about them and their backstory about how they the, how they started. I did think that was quite good, and that's where I'm going to leave my likes. Yeah. All right. So unfortunately, for a great many of you, there are things that I do like, and many of them are mirrored by what Jess has said. The best thing for me about the show was the visual representation of almost everything they did. So uh, in the same way, Jess said. The staging shots, the establishing shots, the the depiction of Numenor, the I think even the armor and the clothing actually did hold up. I'm not one of the ones that's bothered that the elves didn't have long hair. So from a purely visual perspective, I thought the show nailed it. That I think must be where all the money went because um, it looked good, uh, and I do like that. I do agree with that a great deal. Also, as Jess has said, the highest point for the show for me was Elrond and Durin. I thought they were fantastic. I did think the Elrond actor was probably the best in the show, full stop, or period for you Americans. Uh, and I don't think anyone eclipsed him. He, he stood out to me as the best. Uh, and his and Durin's relationship was fantastic. They, they, I did like that, ignoring some of the just nonsense of the story. Um, but of of the, the, the Mithril and all of that non- stuff. But their actual relationship was good. Uh, Durin as well was a very interesting character. I did like him. I thought he was entertaining. Uh, And I also agree that whilst it is a fabrication, the reignition of Mount Doom using the water down from the dam and going under the ground, I did actually quite like that. I thought that was an interesting little way to fill a gap. Um, So I was, uh, yeah, I was pleased with that. And again, as Jess has said, I do think the Halbrand actor, I don't know any of their names, sorry, I don't revere celebrities, but I do think the Halbrand actor was good. He did his job well. He performed what he was given well. Obviously, I dislike the Sauron thing. That's not an unknown to you all. Uh, But I thought Halbrand's actor was at least good. Um... Uh, the music as well, yeah, I think the music uh, was a standout. I, I don't uh, lament that at all. Uh, and I also enjoyed the bigger fight scenes. The, again, the episode that Jess has mentioned, I think, is a standout for both of us. Probably because for most of the rest of it, it's just people talking and most people talking angrily. But for that episode, it was actually things happening. And yeah, when Galadriel was in fights in Numenor, it was the choreography was a bit mm, a bit mm, so it wasn't hot on that, but... Uh, I did enjoy that episode with the large battle and the Numenorians riding in, ignoring the fact that the time jumps around a bit. I I could enjoy that, and I did enjoy that. Uh, but to be honest, that's probably about when I look back where my enjoyment ends. Elrond and Durin stand out. The visuals were good. It was nice to be back in Middle Earth um, to see a Middle Earth because when you read the books as much as I do obviously you've got your imagination of everything but my imagination doesn't run too deeply so it's nice to see someone else's visual depiction of a thing and think oh I hadn't really thought of that yeah I quite like the look of that and the visuals really did stand out for me it did feel like we were back in in Middle Earth I don't think it felt as Jess said it didn't feel like the costumes were poor or the yeah, and I never really noticed the CGI, so that that is a real standout. But to be honest, that is about where my likes end. Yeah, I don't really have points in the story to Lord, nor do um, many of the characters. Oh, I liked Adar, of course. Sorry, I forgot oh, yeah, to mention Adar. Adar was really good. Uh, and Adar story was, was fantastic. Good too. I'm hoping that Adar actually has been serving Sauron all along, and he's going to carry on. He's going to become his like second in command or something because. The alternative is that he'll have to die. There's no two ways. He's either Sauron's enemy or he's his ally. And if he's his enemy, he's going to die at some point. And I hope that doesn't happen because I did like him. Uh, but I think if his 
character is true, uh, i.e. as in his motivations are actually correct and he's not been lying, I can't see any way that Sauron won't just kill him. So that would be disappointing. Mm. But I did like Adar. But that is about it for my I have, likes. I have one more for, to add to my like. Um, I thought the map visualization was really good. That the way in which they showed the map, I thought that was. I liked the map. Um, and so you knew where you were. I knew where you were, and I thought it was. I thought it was good. Um, I thought that was good. All right. So those are the pros. And now let us turn to the significantly longer part of the video. I should think with Jessica's dislikes first. So my dislikes. The main one I. I found very frustrating with the show it was Galadriel um she didn't come across as wise and collected and basically how I basically like Kate Blanchett she didn't come across like Kate Blanchett does in the Lord of the Rings and I know that you shouldn't hone it to that I know she's meant to be so much younger but she's not that much younger than she is in in the show no comparatively it's a blip like in this show she's like in her early 30s and in Lord of the Rings she's in her late 30s like there's yeah. the, the difference is tiny yeah and like she just always seems so angry and frustrated and she seemed very hot-headed which in comparison to how she was depicted in I realize they are films but from what we've discussed in the past, how she's depicted in the books is completely different. Um, and that I found quite jarring. I didn't like the fact how the slow-mo things that they did with her, I thought they made her look a bit laughable, if I'm being honest. Um, like the horse. The horse bit, yeah. Um, and that I found quite frustrating. I was so excited to have, to see Galadriel's story. I was so excited. Um, but I just, it, she was a bit let down for me. And I I, I, th I think she's, like, f look visually, I think she fits it really well. But I just, for me, she was just a bit f annoyed all the time. And she didn't, I didn't feel like she was taking the bigger picture, which I feel like she did in the War of the Ring or Lord of the Rings era. Um, like she was kind of taken out of it because she was aware that it wasn't something she had to impact as much and all that kind of stuff. And it was just a bit disappointing for me, really. Um... I didn't like the Sauron reveal. That annoyed me. Um, I was a bit kind of like, oh, it was, for me, it felt a bit kind of when people say, oh, and it was all a dream or, oh, and it didn't happen. And it was a bit underwhelming, I guess. Um, there were so many, there were so many things that could have been happening with that. Or like, even if they'd done it at the end that he stayed who he was meant to be and then right at the end he shape-shifted so then the characters didn't know but the audience did would have been better for me like it was just annoying that he was revealed then um and I didn't like that um I didn't really like the Balrog reveal I thought that could have been something that they could have kept later on it could have literally just been something with his dad saying that it's too dangerous and he wasn't willing to take that risk or there's no reason or no hint yet that Mithril is amazing or Mithril is amazing. Mithril? Mithril. Mithril um, was amazing or that he just, his dad was just, you know, getting old and he just wasn't willing to take that risk. And then Durin was young, vibrant, coming in being like, no, we're going to get this for our, our, um, what are they, clans? Yeah our clan and it's going to boost us up and then that would be how Durin becomes king in being like you are not following what we we want as our heritage and blah 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 and I feel like the the Balrog could have then been later to show like oh damn we made a mistake here yeah and I that kind of and they showed it and then nothing happened with it and I could just feel like that why why did we need to see that in the first season that could have just been a big thing in the next season um so I thought that was a bit wasted I feel like it was just like a to draw people in it was a bit kind of a bit clickbaity in my opinion um so that was my one and then my last my last one was like an overarching thing about the show it was really slow paced um and i get that a lot of this was kind of story building and world building and having to kind of fill everyone in who doesn't know anything about lord of the rings and i completely get that and i am one of those people um but it was just different episodes and different bits were really slow and you'd have loads crowned into one episode and then suddenly for the next one you'd have everything drawn out over literally 40 minutes and then something would happen in 20 minutes at the end um and it was just a i just thought it was a bit disjointed in the pacing um we didn't get enough in my opinion of world building around the dwarves that there are other dwarves in the world we didn't get enough that there are other men in the world apart from the ones that walked through the field but like who else is there and we didn't learn enough about the elves about their situation about why they're suddenly 
um, their light is dying and all that kind of stuff. It was just said, oh, this is happening. But we didn't get to really know why that's happening. Like, why have they managed, been, been able to be on Middle Earth for thousands and thousands of years? And then suddenly now it's all diminishing. Like, is that because there's an evil or is that because, you know, there's like a time span on how long the light of Valinor, what is it, the light of... Yes, yeah, fair enough. Valinor can last in their system. Like I just felt like there was just bits of it that were just left out that could have been expanded on, and then other bits could have been a lot shorter. Um, and that was a bit disappointing for me. And yeah, that they're my main dislikes, and I'll go on to my other bit for my overview. Yeah. So the uh, general to sum up what I dislike in one simple term would be the story. There wasn't really any part about the story that I actually enjoyed. And I must confess that to knowing that the showrunner's plan was to try and fill in the blanks that Tolkien left behind in a Tolkien-esque way, I would say they failed at that. Um, but obviously to hone that down more, the things that I really disliked um, starting with some of the minor points, some of the characters, um, the acting was just a, a, a bit iffy. I didn't like Bronwyn or Theo. I thought both mm. of those were so noticeable as standout bads. And also, whilst I dislike the Hobbits in general, and we'll come on to that, um, obviously, <laughs> Hollywood, or rather America, they seem to think that what we in England would consider West Country or Irish or Scottish or um, like Midland accents, America sees these accents as simple and it has to ascribe them to these people. So to make the Hobbits appear more simple, they give them these what we would call a West Country accent or um, they were just so all over the place. But the problem with that was that the actors had no idea what accents they were trying to do. So for most of you Americans, probably you would have heard those accents and thought nothing of it. But imagine, if you will, an English show where they said, right, let's have some people doing Texas access, accents and some doing like uh, New York or, or New England. Or Florida. Um, you or would know straight away, or oh, that person is not from that mm. place and they really don't understand how that accent sounds. And that unfortunately came across. The only Hobbit who actually sounded like she had her real accent was the main one, um, Nori. Uh, but the others, it was just wildly all over the place. Like uh, Deesa and Durin. Deesa is not Scottish, but Durin is. And so his accent is spot on because he's a Scottish person. Deesa isn't. And when you hear them together, you can tell that she's putting on a Scottish accent. And so the accents throughout were just iffy. And I just thought, why couldn't you just have them doing normal voices? Why do they have to be English simpletons? Which in itself is such a farce and so offensive to anyone outside of like our accent which is what you might call the Queen's English, which doesn't mean we speak posh, it just means we speak without an accent. But obviously if someone in Liverpool or someone else in England would say we have an accent and they don't, but generally accepted the world over is that we have the accent less English and they have accented English. But it's so offensive to them that their accent in the rest of the world is seen as simple. Mm. But anyway, that bit aside, though, let's start with the Hobbits. I disliked everything about them. They did not need to be in this show. They were yeah. slow. They ground the story to a halt every time they came into it. Um, and I didn't really like Lenny Henry. I thought his acting was good, but his character was annoying. Mm. So Lenny Henry did all right, but he's a seasoned actor, so you'd expect so. But the character he had to portray was just irritating. And I didn't yeah. understand that. I didn't I did like think that. He, I thought... I, for me, when he was... Uh, Lenny actually, Henry, by the way, is the main Hobbit. Yeah. I appreciate many of you probably don't know that. Lenny Henry. We know who he is because he's very famous in England. But I thought, I didn't, when I saw him, I didn't automatically think like, that's Lenny Henry. Like, I mm. thought he was, I thought he did well in the yeah. show. And um, He's a notable comedian as well, which is why a show like this is actually quite mm. bizarre for him. But yeah, I didn't like the Harfoots at all. They did not need to be in the show and it would have been better if their whole bit was cut. Get rid of Gandalf as well. That's such a nonsense. Why bother having Gandalf if you're not going to call him Gandalf? You're, you're missing out on the only reason you've put him in there, which is to try and link another noticeable name for the, all the casuals. So they'll be like, oh yeah, no, we know who Gandalf is. He's like the main character. So they would know who that is. But then they've not called him Gandalf. So they've done away with their one reason of putting him in the show. I just thought that was stupid. So do away with him, do away with the Harfoots, and then we can actually spend more time learning about the elves, about why they need to build this tower, why they're diminishing, as Jess says. Just more, just <laughs> more about the people that actually matter. Yeah. The Hobbits just were stupid. I didn't think that, just because I said that I would say what I didn't like about the Hobbits and I forgot. Um, 
I don't think the hobbits fit in the story. Like it was always a massive change of pace when we then went to the hobbits. And it was always at points that you were disappointed that mm. you were coming away from the story. Um, and it didn't, like if, if you take out um, the wizard, because we don't know it's Gandalf yet. It's Gandalf. Um, if you take out the wizard, they didn't have anything to do with the story. They didn't have, they didn't impact anything. And you could have just, if you needed a wizard to land, he could have landed, he could have touched on the fact like he could have, you know, created a crater and scared away all these halflings, but you didn't need to like see them. Like They could have just hinted at it. it I don't know. They, they, they could have done it slightly differently. And then we could have seen how the wizard was going through the world in a different way. They didn't add anything to the story. No, I think it would have been better if they must, if they had to have Gandalf in it, then introduce him right at the end of the first season, already as an established Gandalf in Rune. Do like some character mentions that something's happening in Rune and we don't know what, and then do like a quick shot over to Rune and then have it be Gandalf. Mm. You don't need to set Gandalf up because he's so memorable. He's he like to most casual fans, say Lord of the Rings to them and they will think of Frodo and Gandalf. They're the two main standouts from the film, I think, to most casual people. So having Gandalf just didn't need a setup, and thereby we didn't need the Hobbits. And just to touch the last point on the Hobbits, of course, a point of the writing. The Hobbits chant is nobody goes off trail and no one gets left behind, or no one goes off trail and no one walks alone. Mm. But then as soon as one of them uh, twists his ankle, sod him, you can walk on your own, we're not interested in you, sorry, go die. Like, what? <laughs> what? Do the showrunners not even read their own writing? That's just bad, no matter what way you swing it. There is, the Hobbits have no time limit on them. They're not running away from something, and they're not running to anything. They're just walking about, looking for food, finding places to move around. Why would it matter if they slow down a bit so one guy's leg can heal? It was just bizarre. They were just awful. And it was just that whole ankle thing was just done to create fake tension. And no one likes fake tension. It's like Isildur. Isildur's not going to be dead because he's a main character. Why do you do this fake out that Isildur's died? I just hate these things so much. It, like, treat us with a bit of respect. The audience knows who the characters are. We know who's going to survive. So can we not have these, like, oh, he almost died. Oh, but he didn't die. Like, of course he didn't die. He's a sealed door. But anyway, that's getting off track. I didn't like The Hobbits. Also, Gandalf. Yeah, I don't... If it is going to be Gandalf, just say it's Gandalf. Don't give us the, all these ridiculous clues. The follow your nose line, which Gandalf says in Moria. Um, the levitation battle is reminiscent of Saruman and Gandalf's battle in the films. And again, the show, remember, is linking to the films. They can sing and dance all they want about how they're reverential to the books. The show is trying to capture the film audience. And when you have that understanding in your mind, it's easier to interpret what they're doing. And that thereby it's obviously Gandalf. The fact that he turns the wraith cult people into moths, which again only happens in the film. There isn't a moth that talks to Gandalf in the books. Gwahir just saves him. Or Gwahir. Um, he doesn't have a moth that goes and interprets for him. That's just in the film to create a kind of visual key. So when you see the moth, you think, ah, oh, the eagles are coming. Um, and then again, obviously, he turned them into the moth. So again, that's a Gandalf thing. And then lastly, this is the weakest one, but I think it builds into it, is he tells them to go back to go back from whence they came, which is obviously just a normal English phrase. It's a bit archaic, but it is just a normal phrase. Uh, but Gandalf specifically uses it against the Balrog in the Khazad-dum uh, fight. So uh, it's just that guy's obviously going to be Gandalf. It's, it's just too obvious. So why don't they just call him Gandalf? But anyway, so I dislike that. And then we come to the worst bits for the show for me. Number one, we can't not talk about Galadriel. Galadriel, as Jess said, looked a lot like Galadriel, but she was just insufferable. And Amazon, as many people will try and harp on that Amazon was, the show is some sort of woke story thing. I'm not going to comment on that because I don't give a damn about that. Like, don't burden me with your thoughts. <laughs> like I'm burdening you with mine. Um, but they've gone for a strong female lead and they've chosen a character who has a strong female story which is good and they've made her just annoying as hell no one is going to be like oh yeah i want to be like galadriel i want to be angry at everyone i ever talk to and distrust everyone around me like she was just annoying really annoying and she could have <clears throat> the way in which she tried to get people over to her side she was just basically saying like you have to do what i want you to do because this is important she wasn't like using 
any like skill of persuasion and she wasn't no. nice and she wasn't you know like i just feel like if it was different like she would have persuaded and like apologized to muriel and all that kind of stuff and yeah. i just think it could have been different like rather than basically saying like no i'm important so you have to do what i'm saying yeah so the, my my one word for galadriel would be she was insufferable uh, so I didn't like Galadriel at all. Anytime she was on screen, I was like, let's just get past this, please. This is rubbish. Um, and so, yeah, that Galadriel. Then the elf story just in general. Um, points of this, though, I link into Halbrand mostly because Halbrand, of course, is my biggest disappointment with the show, as you all know. But the elves just in general, I didn't like Gilgalad. Gilgalad was there apparently just to be the antagonist. They didn't have a proper enemy yet, so they needed someone to be an enemy. Adar and his orcs were too far away. We needed an enemy in Linden. And they made Gilgalad that enemy. And I just don't... Why? Why do you need your king who sacrifices himself in the, free, in the name of the free peoples? And who is, like all other elven kings, basically the purest of pure. Why does he have to be your bad character? Just bring in some random advisor to be your antagonist who doesn't think anything should happen. Why do you have to sour Gilgalad with it? Uh, I just, and his reasoning was just nonsense. If we turn to the ring section... Gilgalad says, no, we can't forge a crown. We can't forge the rings because we've run out of time. We've got to leave Middle-earth now. And he won't even give them one or two days to at least try to make the ring. It's just one of those really ridiculous, convoluted writing points again. Gilgalad's getting everyone out of Middle-earth. And while everyone's leaving, Celebrimbor cannot possibly try and create two rings while they're getting all the rest of the elves out. No, 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 no. He's got to stand around and wait. Like, it just makes no sense. They're, it just can't possibly hurt the elves to try and make the rings. But then that leads on to the next point, which is perhaps my biggest disappointment with the Sauron Halbrand story. Why... Did Galadriel not stop them making the rings when she learnt that was Sauron? It makes no sense whatsoever. In the original and much better story, please do read the books if you've watched this show. The only thing I would say is go and read the books. Um, in the original story, the rings are created. Sauron teaches them how to create the rings to, to defend um, against this corruption, this diminishing of the elves. But unbeknownst to them, he's also making it so that he'll be then be able to dominate the rings. Um, so the elves go along with it and then they learn they've been tricked when Sauron makes his own ring, which just works. So then they think this benevolent uh, Maya, because at that point, Anatar, I've said throughout this show, these videos that Anatar comes to them as an elf, but he doesn't. He comes from as if he's a, um, a Maya from Valinor who's come to teach them this magic. So a bit better than an elf. But anyway, that's by the by. He comes in this benevolent form and he's like, I can save you. I will teach you how to make magic devices that will save the elves. It will stop them from fading away. It will give you your powers. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he says. And they're like, yeah, brilliant. Because without this, we're dead. So we've got no other option. So we'll do it. Brilliant. Smashing. And Celebrimbor gets wholly invested in it. And then Sauron makes his own ring and they're tricked. But this time, yes, they're making the rings to push back the corruption, but is that worth knowing that Sauron made those rings? Galadriel would know there'd be some trick, there'd be some caveat. But she doesn't bother with it. And then Elrond doesn't step in either when he then learns that it's Sauron as well, which we're supposed to think when we see him holding the scroll. And that just makes absolutely no sense. Galadriel's entire driving force is that Sauron is bad and he must die. And it's on her to stop him doing anything he tries to do. Oh, but when he creates rings that my people will use, yeah, I won't bother telling anyone about that. We'll just fall to his dominion. That's not a problem. It just goes totally against her insufferable character arc. And I just didn't understand that. So that, and then the final point on the elves before I go fully into Halbrand, why were they even building the tower? In the first few episodes, Keller Brimble was like, oh yeah, we need to build this tower. We need to build it up real soon. So go and get the meter while we're building the tower. What, were the point? what was the point of the tower? It made, like, they never touched on it again. Um, did they need the entire tower just to build that little forge? It just made no sense. Uh, I just thought that was stupid. Um, really, really stupid. Uh, and then, of course, we have Halbrand. Halbrand is Sauron. Sauron, at this point, I get it. They're trying to make Sauron appear like he actually did repent. They're trying to go for an angle of Morgoth was defeated, Morgoth's hold over Sauron was then lifted, and he then has a genuine moment of, oh Jesus, I was really evil. Maybe I should try and help these people. And that's, that's as far as the show ever delves into that. Then immediately we, we then learn, no, 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 this is normal Sauron, he's evil, he's gone back to Mordor, and he is going to try and like rule the world. 
So they do away with the repenting thing almost immediately. So then there are some key questions about Sauron that I just don't think work. And I think they've glossed over them to have their gotcha moment. It was Sauron all along. Uh, the major ones. Why did he save Galadriel? In what possible universe, whether he wants to dominate the elves or not, he knows how much Galadriel hates him. He killed three of her brothers, one of them almost with his own hand. He would be fully aware of Galadriel's vendetta against him. Why did he not just kill her in the ocean and leave it be? It just that made no sense. Saving her say, had no benefit whatsoever. And some people have said, ah, oh, but he tried to corrupt Galadriel. He wanted Galadriel on his side. It's like, but he wouldn't. He wants to rule the world. And Galadriel is at the moment the only person in the world who's desperate to stop him. Like, okay, maybe some vanity would say, yeah, I'll turn my greatest enemy into my servant. Maybe. But even then, his life is just so much easier if he just kills Galadriel. And then we come on to, why is he on a raft? Sauron can transform into anything he wants to. In the stories, he transforms into a cloud of bats to escape from a certain um, fortress. He can literally be anything he wants. In what possible conceivable universe is it in his advantage to appear as a shipwrecked sailor? I just don't get it. And I don't think the showrunners are going to be clever enough to write something that is fitting. Because apparently in season two, we're going to learn why he's in the ocean. But if Sauron's goal is to get to Numenor, we already now know that Pelagir exists within this show's universe. He can shapeshift. Why doesn't he just go to Pelagir, pretend to be a Numenorian, and just sail back with the Numenorians? It just makes no sense. It just really makes no sense. Everything about Sauron just doesn't make sense, and it's just so disappointing. But I have a long list, so let's just read through the rest of them. My next one, I can sort of understand this, but why does he actually help the Numenorians? It is not in his interests to help the Numenorians. So when he rides to war against the orcs with them, there's a moment where you see him save Elendil, and they put that in there just to try and make you think again that he's not Sauron. But it is in no way in Sauron's interest to save Elendil, and that's such a stupid little addition. I didn't like that. I can understand him killing his own orcs because he just doesn't care about his own people, so he'd happily fight against his own orcs. But why does he help the Numenorians so much? And if he just needs to earn their trust, why doesn't he just transform into a Numenorian, which he can do? He doesn't need to earn their trust. He can just be one of them. It's just, I just hate it so much. Hate it so much. I've already talked about the elves. Why would they bother making the rings now that Galadriel knows Sauron is involved? If we don't get the first scene of season two being Galadriel saying, don't use those rings, Sauron made them, then I'm out. I'm, I'm, that's it, I'm done. I'm not going to watch any more because that's just ridiculous. Also, from a personal point of view, I'm really disappointed we're not going to get the full Anatar story. I don't know whether they're not allowed to use Anatar. I've, I've looked into it. Some people don't think they can. Some people think they can. I don't know which is true. I personally am disappointed we're not going to get Anatar. I wanted a conniving evil elf who has that kind of just, he seems good, and then every now and then you're like, oh no, this guy, something's off with this guy. Halbrand didn't have that. Halbrand spends the entire show being, I am good. I don't want to be the king of my people, but I'm good. Uh, and all right, I'll be the king because you want me to be. Oh, look how good I am. And then suddenly he's Sauron. Anatar wouldn't have had that. He would have had layers. And I would just really like that. I would really have preferred that. And in my head, I always think of Moriarty from the recent Sherlock Holmes with Benedict Cumberbatch mm. and Martin Freeman, where Moriarty just, he was so good. That actor, I don't, again, I don't know his name. I'm sorry. But he was so good at making you think, oh, this guy seems like he's so friendly. And then he's like, he switches on a, on a knife edge and suddenly it's like, oh, no, this guy is wrong. But Halbrand just didn't have that. He was just good, 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 good. Now I'm Sauron. And it was just so disappointing. So we're not going to get that grey layers that we get with Anatar. And if, as some people have suggested, Anatar is now going to come into the show, that's going to just be ridiculous. He's already created the three elven rings. What more could he possibly need to do? It, like, obviously, the other rings need to be created for the story to work. But... Like, why does Anatar now need to be involved with them? And why and now we're going to have Celebrimbor getting tripped by Sauron twice. I just don't think we're going to see Anatar. Anatar was just so much cooler. And that then also leads into Celebrimbor's biggest failing. And this is a genuine question. Is he a moron? Like, is Celebrimbor actually an idiot? Because he's meant to be the, the best smith in the world at this time. Uh, not including Valinor. 
And he doesn't know what alloys are. He didn't think to possibly try and like, mix the mithril with another metal to make it last longer. It's just so stupidly written. I have never done anything about engineering in my life. And yet I am familiar with the concept of alloys. He's meant to be the best smith in the world. It's just so stupid. Whereas in the Anatar story, Anatar convinces Celebrimbor to work with him because Celebrimbor has the passion and ambition that his grandfather, Feanor, also had. And Anatar uses that to get Celebrimbor on his side. So he appeals basically to the vanity of Celebrimbor. Um, and the, and more to the ambition, not so much the vanity, but he appeals to that side of Celebrimbor that wants to be as renowned as his grandfather was. Uh, and not just that he comes with a basic smithing technique and all of a sudden they're best friends. I'd really just like that. Again, that was just so stupid. What, do these people not sit down and think about what they're writing? Like, do they, are they so in a bubble that they just don't think, uh, I just don't get it. I do not understand it. Also, just from a point of view as the show, the ring creation was like 20 minutes of one episode. The show is called Rings of Power, and the first, the creation of three of arguably the most important rings was 20 minutes of one episode. We had no build up to them building these, creating these rings. We never knew if the rings were the end point of season one, or if just building this tower and getting the mithril was the end point. So when it transpired that actually the whole show had been building to them creating the three elven rings, it's like, well, we've had no indication of that, and you've you've all just literally agreed in the past five minutes that you can't make a crown, so it's now going to need to be rings. And it was like 20 minutes of eight hours worth of television. It's just not enough for the main thing of the show. And don't get me started on the fact that the Elven Rings have been made first. Like, this is just silly. It's just silly. The Elven Rings are supposed to not be made under Sauron's guise. That's how they don't corrupt the elves that wield them. They do corrupt them to an extent, but... The human rings and the dwarven rings were made by Sauron and Celebrimbor together. Celebrimbor is taught how to make them by Sauron and Sauron watches over. Then when Sauron buggers off, Celebrimbor makes the elven rings on his own. So they're still touched by the darkness because he's using techniques that Sauron taught him. But Sauron isn't there overseeing the creation. So that's how they are able to carry on using their rings despite the One Rings uh, being revealed and, and it's corrupting and controlling um, powers. But now we don't have that because Sauron was there creating them. They fundamentally changed the core story of the rings. I don't hate that from a law purist point of view. I hate that from a point of view that now the show's not going to make sense within its own universe because the one ring and the elven rings now won't work. And again, on the presumption that the show is tied into the film universe, they've just rewritten the film universe. It's just a nonsense. It's just such a nonsense. Why couldn't these rings have just been the human rings? Why do we need this whole story? story of the elves diminishing like yes the elves are diminishing but not as or not as obviously as the show does with a tree dying with its leaves and all that kind of nonsense and the elves don't diminish for another thousands of years and it just changed the whole point of them then i mentioned about gilglad uh, opposing the rings which just makes no sense and that's just poor writing they needed some sort of stake so they made gilglad be evil and it just didn't make sense it just didn't make any sense why would gilglad not try everything he's the king of the elves for crying out loud or he's the high king of the noldor it just uh, that was just stupid and totally against gilglad's character and i didn't like gilglad i think i've already said that but throughout the whole show he was just so negative nelly it's like oh just smile yeah. for once you daft mean, bastard like his, I, his character wasn't likable and it didn't make no, sense with what we all. know about him from the films and all that kind of stuff but um the actual actor i thought was good but well yeah he he again he portrayed an annoying person very well so um but i think he, i think him. he gave off that like i'm important vibe yeah so yeah yeah that's true that's true and then my final point and i'm this one i'm worried for the future why did the numenorians let halbrand out of prison in the show, Halbrand nearly kills a Numenorian, and at this point we're shown how xenophobic the Numenorians are. So think of, if you will, that, and I know this is extreme, but it's just a good way to explain it. Think of Nazism, and think of a Jewish person going to Nazi Germany and almost killing a pure-blood German person. How do you think the Nazis would have dealt with that person? They would have executed him immediately. And at this point in the show, we're led to believe that the Numenorians are approaching that level of xenophobia and racism. We have that whole thing about elves coming and stealing jobs, which was so on the nose. It was just ridiculous. 
Um, so the Numenorians would never have just put Halbrand in prison for a start. They would have killed him straight up. He assaulted like four people and he almost killed one. And he's a nothingy nobody Southlander that the Numenorians have shown they don't give a damn about. So starting off, why didn't they kill him? Secondly, if they are going to put him in prison, why did they ever let him out again? The show doesn't explain it. Galadriel does her stupid little fight thing where she pushes four, <laughs> four guards into a prison cell, which was a nonsense. Uh, and then Halbrand whispers to Farazon something. And then, boom, in the next episode, he's out of prison. It's, it's, it was like, what? Why? Why would you let him out? Let him rot in your yeah. dungeon cell. And being welcomed into one of the guilds. And be welcomed into a guild. Because we see him get rejected from the guild. And then you think, all right, that's it. The Numenorians aren't going to take him on. But then, no, three episodes later, he's just suddenly working for them. And it's like, nothing has happened. You've gone from a prisoner to now being accepted into the guild. And this is where I'm really concerned... Because Sauron's real story, a bit of a spoiler for you, apologies. Sauron's real story is that he's captured by the Numenorians as Sauron. They know he is Sauron and they capture him to try and stop him expanding in Middle-earth. And he willingly goes with them because he sees he can easily corrupt these weak people because they're weak-minded, they're not weak-bodied. Uh, and he goes to Numenor as a prisoner and he rises from a prisoner all the way up to the chief counsellor of the king through his powers, through his deception, his manipulation. And I'm really concerned that that little scene of him just somehow getting out of prison is going to be that whole Sauron story. I'm really worried that Sauron is not going to be captured by the Numenorians. We're not going to get any of that. And they are basically going to rewrite the whole thing. And that is... That bit of Numenor's history is arguably my favourite part of the whole of the Lord of the Rings. So naturally, I'm just disappointed on a general level because my favourite thing is going to be rewritten. They might not do that. It might stay the same and I get to see finally Farazon making Sauron kneel before him, which I'm really looking forward to. But maybe they, I just worry they're not going to do that. But for me, Halbrand being Sauron just did not work. There are too many holes in the story. And if they want to explain it away as, oh no, Sauron was going to be good, but then Galadriel somehow forced him to return to his evil ways, which I just don't get. Um, then, I, then I just don't think that was explained well enough. I, I just don't understand Sauron's motivation in any stage. And the whole thing fails for me and why Sauron, an all-powerful shape-shifting Maya, would be shipwrecked in the ocean <laughs> just he can be anything he wants to be just bugger off just go to wherever you're going he doesn't even need to use passage to Numenor he could turn into a fish swim to Numenor and then turn into a Numenorian and just walk about no one would question him it's so stupid and the show just is not bothering with it and I just I, I'm just disappointed I'm disappointed, but let's not labour too long because it's already 40 minutes. I was hoping this would only be about half an hour. So, Jessica, what was your overall opinion of the show as a whole? So, um, I forgot to... I left off uh, Aaron Deer. He was a good character too. I liked him. He was one of my favourites, I have to say. Yeah, he was let down by his supporting characters being quite annoying. Yeah, but, but his... Yeah, Aaron Deer was good. He was good. Um, I... It didn't draw me back, so I wasn't... I wanted to watch the show because I wanted to find out how what happened. I wanted to find out. Um, I like Lord of the Rings, um, clearly not as much as uh, Ed, but I like. I liked the fact that it was drawing back and bringing people back into that world. And like, I was quite. I'm excited for what that might open in the future in terms of like games or like stuff, merchandise. Who knows? I think that would be. I like stuff like that, so um, that, I think that's a good thing. Consumerism. Consumerism. Um, but it didn't make me excited. By the end, I'd say by episode six, um, maybe a bit before that, it didn't draw me back. Like There are so many fantasy uh, series at the moment, and the, the one which I compare it to quite a lot in my head is The Witcher. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed The Witcher. Um, I thought it was really exciting. Like We actually ended up binging it in like a day. Um, and it was it was just really good. I was always on the edge of my seat. I enjoyed every single episode, and I just didn't feel that with this show. Um, it, it just didn't have the same kind of draw, and I liked elements of it, but I didn't like the whole thing. Like the, there were a lot of things which were really frustrating about it, and like it made you sigh. So that was a bit annoying. But so for me, 
it would probably, I'd probably give it a six out of 10. I liked the concept. I liked it enough that I watched the second season. Um, but I wasn't like, super excited. Like I'm not so disappointed that it's not going to be here for like two years. I'm not kind of, I'm not sad. Like, I'm not on the edge of my seat waiting for it, but I will watch it when it comes out. But there are other things that I, that I watch now, even just sitcoms, which I look forward to watching more than I did this show, which is a shame. But I think six out of 10 is quite, still quite high. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, there were bits of the show that I enjoyed. They weren't strong enough to make me look forward to the next season. I've already put Rings of Power completely out of my mind. I'm not anticipating anything more. I'm not looking forward to the next. I think Rings of Power's biggest failing and take away the Lord of the Rings lore points. So obviously I know a lot about the lore. I don't hate the show for the changes to the lore. If there are points that I'm disappointed that aren't going to appear in the show, then yeah, I'm personally disappointed, but I don't hate the show for trying to rewrite Tolkien. That's the bit you won't get from me. I don't care about that. But I don't think the show, whether you like Lord of the Rings or not, was enjoyable enough. It was unfortunately decidedly average. And that's its biggest failing, really. All this money went into this show and it was just meh. So for me, I, I mean, I want to give it a five, but that just is too generous. I'm, I'm like four, maybe even a three out of ten if I had to give it a number. There were some high points that I genuinely thought that was an enjoyable hour of television. But that they were so few and far between. And it was there was never one whole episode where I thought, yeah, I really enjoyed that whole episode. The closest probably was the fight scene in the in Mordor. That was probably the closest episode I got to actually just enjoying it. And that's probably because they just made the story take a bit of a back seat and they finally just had some fun action. Elves versus orcs with humans on joining in and then Numenorians riding into aid. Like when you could just switch your brain off and enjoy a bit of action. And the action was good. I thought it was good. But no, the show was just unfortunately average. And it needed to be better than that. It needed to be the show we're all talking about um, to make back any any hope of making back its money. And it's just not going to do that. But it's not a good addition to Lord of the Rings as a whole. And like the films are a good representation of the books, in my opinion. They omit the right things. Uh, and they keep in the right things and they make a good, succinct story of the books. Uh, they're a good watch alongside the books to help you visualize some bits if you're not as good at that. But Rings of Power is not a good aid to reading the Silmarillion or Unfinished Tales. Or, um, well, Unfortunately, the period of time that Rings of Power covers is not in a succinct book. It's not in a novel. It's written in, in parts of other books. Uh, but Rings of Power is not a good one to watch and to, it would just leave you with more questions than answers, um, unfortunately. Or it would leave you with questions more than it will be satisfying visualisation of what you think is going to happen. So, uh, yeah, it's just average. It's just average as a show. The writing's pretty iffy. There's a lot of obvious holes that even if I can see them, then it's terrible because I'm by no means a literary critic. Um, and I just think it suffers because it's average <laughs> so that would be my overall review of the show um i don't expect i'll ever watch season one again to be honest mm. it, that's it's probably most damning thing i can say about it it doesn't make me want to watch it again but anyway that is our thoughts on the show finally for you all i tried not to give my thoughts on the show throughout each individual episode because i didn't want the episodes to be about oh look how terrible this show is or why does everyone keep shilling on this show it's amazing um, I wanted them to be about the actual law. What's Amazon not telling you? But many of you requested this, so we've done it. But there will be one more video which will go back to the law and make me happier to end on, where Jess is just going to point out some of the things that she's seen in the episode, some Easter eggy bits, questions about what is that in the background, and we can just try and um, talk a little bit about things that appeared in the episodes. Law Easter eggs. Uh, but that will be the last episode of Rings of Power Season 1. But for this one, that's all for now. So thank you very much for watching, if indeed you have. I do hope it's been enjoyable, despite it being a bit of a rant. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope to see you all for the last one, uh, the Easter egg coverage one next time. But for now, and until we speak again, Navayar Naden Perimad Melonin. And farewell. And farewell.